Jesus. I woke up this morning with my mind and it was stayed on Jesus. I woke up this morning with my mind and stayed on Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Everybody say, it ain't no harm to keep your mind stayed on Jesus. It ain't no harm to keep your mind stayed on Jesus. It ain't no harm to keep your mind oh, stayed on Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. I woke up, come on. I woke up this morning with my mind and it was stayed on Jesus. I woke up this morning with my mind and it was stayed on Jesus. I woke up this morning with my mind, oh, stay on Jesus. Holly, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Ain't no harm. It ain't no harm to keep your mind. Oh, stay. Oh, it ain't no harm to keep your mind. Stay on Jesus. Oh, it ain't no harm to keep your mind. Oh, stay on Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Walking and talking, I'm walking and talking with my mind. Stayed on Jesus. I'm walking and talking with my mind. Stayed on Jesus. Oh, I'm walking and talking with my mind. Oh, stay. On oh, Jesus, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I woke up this morning, I woke up this morning with my mind. Oh, stay. Oh, oh, I woke up this morning with my mind. Stayed on oh, Jesus. Oh. I woke up this morning with my mind, oh, say, oh, Jesus, hallelujah, 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 amen, amen. We welcome you, we welcome you to the first in the second time around early service amen early service uh, we have experienced mount Ali being at capacity and a tree or plant can only grow as big as the pot that it is in so we are attempting to create a second service to handle the capacity and the growth that is to come so we welcome you Live to the sanctuary of the Mount Ali Baptist Church for our first 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. Hour of power. I don't know if we're going to call it that going forward. We're about 30 minutes behind, but we're going to get there right next week. Amen. So let's prepare now for our scripture uh, and prayer from Minister Benny McCanch, Jr. Amen. Today I'll be reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. I'll be reading from the Gospel of Matthew, 11th chapter and the 27th verse, and it reads as such. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Amen. I'm going to ask missionary evangelist Deborah Britt to come with a prayer, with our opening prayer 
for the morning. Let the church say amen. Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. God is good all the time and all the time. God is good. Praising God for another day. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this is the day that you have made. And we are rejoicing and we're super glad. We're excited to be in the land of the living. Lord, we thank you for this second time around. Early morning glory or hour of power, whatever you, you, we're going to call it, we're here this morning to lift you up. So, Lord, we thank you for those of that, that are here. We want you to saturate the atmosphere for those who are coming, Lord Jesus. Set it up, Lord. Set it up for miracles, signs, and wonders. We thank you for our man of God. We thank you, Lord Jesus, and we thank you, Lord, because this is Father's Day, and you are our true and living Father. You are the Almighty. Thank you for the fathers, Lord, that you're raising up in this kingdom, men of valor, in the name of Jesus. So we want you to do a new thing today. As the people come into this service, as they come into the next service, Lord, do it again. We're looking for miracle signs and wonders in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, we have the victory. In the name of Jesus, Satan will have to flee. Hallelujah. Tell me who can stand Hallelujah. before us when we call on that great name. Jesus, Jesus, we have the victory. God bless you. Amen, 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 amen. Come on, come on, come on. We do have the victory. We do have the victory. Y'all got one more song in you? One more song. Come on. Victory is mine. Victory is mine. Victory today is mine. Oh, I told Satan, get thee behind. Victory today is mine. Come on. Victory, victory. Victory is mine. Victory is mine. Victory today is mine. I told Satan, get thee behind. Victory today is mine. Come on, joy is mine. Joy is mine. Joy is mine. Joy today is mine. Oh, I told Satan, get thee behind. Victory today is mine. Come on, victory, victory. Victory is mine. Victory is mine. Victory today is mine. Oh, I told Satan, get thee behind. Victory today is mine. Happiness, happiness is mine. Happiness is mine. Happiness today is mine. I told Satan, I told Satan, get yeah. oh victor today is mine. Last time, happiness, happiness is mine. Happiness is mine. Happiness today is mine. I told I get thee behind. Happiness today is mine. Amen. Amen. We are excited and delighted to be in the house of the Lord one more time. On this Father's Day, we greet every father who is a father by birth, uh, a father by just stepping up to the plate, spiritual fathers, those who have served in the capacity and roles as fathers. We pause to recognize you on this day, Father's Day 2024. We also, uh, it is not lost on us that this is our Juneteenth weekend, but we recognize and celebrate all that those who or of the African diaspora across these United States uh, experience on Juneteenth when we were finally liberated and set free 
uh, across this nation. So we honor both of those uh, moments today. Uh, I want to now prepare us uh, for the word of the Lord. Uh, I'm going to ask Brother Julius to put up the title slide that we may introduce it, and then we're going to make our way to 2 Samuel chapter 11, 2 Samuel chapter 11. When you have it, if you'd be so kind as to say amen. 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 Second Samuel chapter 11. The good news is that Second Samuel is always after First Samuel. Amen. Anybody glad about that, that the books of the Bible don't move around? I'd be in trouble, y'all, if I tell the whole truth. Second Samuel chapter 11. Just going to read the first verse for your consideration today. Uh, certainly invite you to read verses 1 through 27, the entire chapter that you may experience the fullness of the message. Amen. This is what the word of the Lord reads from 2 Samuel chapter 11. It happened in the spring of the year at the time when kings go out to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel and they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. I just want to read the first part of verse 2. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. So we'll, eat, we'll end right there. Second Samuel chapter 11 verses 1 and the A clause of verse 2. With the help of the Lord for just a few moments, I want to talk from this thought, the danger of men not being present. The danger of men not being present. Amen. In this service, don't know who's viewing, how many people are going to view, uh, but I have made it up in my mind. This is where I'm going to work on my confidence and in my singing because ain't nothing but five people in here. Amen. And they all love me. And if there's any comments on Facebook, I can't see them. Amen. But just give me two minutes and we're going to get to the word. Amen. I am free. Praise the Lord. I'm free. No longer bound. No more chains holding me. My soul is resting. Oh, what a blessing. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm free. Amen. Amen. That was my one. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. I am free. Amen. As we prepare for uh, this message and this lesson today. Why is it significant? Why is it important? Because there is danger when people are not where they're supposed to be. I remember reading of a law school case that was about maritime law, which uh, is about what happens on the water. And one particular case that, that I remember, I can't remember the name of the case, but there was someone who had the responsibility of being at the dock to ensure that when the boats came in, that they arrived safely without damaging the boat or the dock. 
But this particular occasion, the one who was responsible for being there wasn't in his place, wasn't on his assigned, wasn't at his assigned post. And as a consequence, that millions of damage to this boat was done, and this is the frustrating part, it was unnecessary. That if this brother had just been where he was supposed to be at the time he was supposed to be paying attention to the things that had been placed under his responsibility. All of that tragedy and damage could have been avoided. And it is my premise this morning, saints of God, that as we look at the state of black America, as we look at the state of families, the disintegration of family structure, that, that, that a big part of it is because men have not been present and accounted for, not been where we have supposed to have been, and as a consequence, there are tragic and long-lasting repercussions. So it's my hope today that I will, uh, on one hand, uh, provide further insight on the dangers and the disparity that results in our community when men are not present. But then on the other hand, I never just want to be a prophet of doom. But I also want to give us some things to consider and ponder on about how we can be more present, the appointed places and spaces that God has called us to be. As we go to, uh, to the slides, the first slide lays out for us uh, the significance and importance of this. Uh, the lesson applies to you because you are a leader. And because you are a leader, your presence and you being present matters. Let me say that again. This lesson, this message applies to you because you are a leader. And because you are a leader, your presence and you being present matters. Amen? As we uh, reflect on this introductory point, that so much has happened in our lives that would try to rob you of the notion that you are a leader, that, that, that you are one that people look to, and all you have to do is look back over your life, and I am certain saints of God that you will find examples where you recognize that people are looking to you to be a leader. Y'all don't like me? Let me give you a few examples. You ever been on your job and discovered that people who don't like you don't even halfway talk to you, but let a little trials and tribulations break out in their life? You didn't even know that they knew you went to church next thing you know they're knocking on your door coming by your cubicle trying to sit next to you in the lunchroom or the break room asking will you pray for me will, will will you put me on your prayer list I wish I had some help up in here not not only that I want you to think about in your life think about your friends and particularly your family that when things are happening in your life ain't you the first one that they call Aren't you the one that they're looking for to solve every problem, to be the source of the solution? I'm trying to tell you, saint of God, because of the anointing on your life, because of the power and purposes and plans of God on your life, you are a leader and it's undeniable. And here is the great challenge, saints of God, that we've got a lot of leaders who are trying to hide in the shadows. A lot of leaders who are attempting to sit on the sidelines while the game of life is unfolding. But in the name of Jesus, we need leaders who will stand up and who will speak out in this present age in which we find ourselves. But the great challenge is that enough people don't recognize that you're leaders. Why are you a leader? We didn't sing it earlier. It was on my heart. But there's a simple song the saints of old used to sing, say, this little light of mine. I wish I had some help with me here. I'm going to let it shine. shine. Shine everywhere I go. Shine in my home. Shine everywhere I go. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. I like that next verse that said, Jesus, y'all ain't going to help me. Jesus gave it to me, so I'm going to let it shine. Y'all didn't like that. Can I put some Bible on it? Jesus said, you are the light of the world. 
that you are a city that has been set upon a hill, that you are a lighthouse, that you are a light, and no one takes a light and puts it under a bushel or a basket, but they put it in a high and elevated place that, in fact, it may bring light and illumination to all that are around. Here it is, saints of God. You're a leader because you got the light. You got the light that's undeniable because Jesus said you are the light of the world. And if Jesus said it, I can't deny it. I can't run from it. I can try to hide in dark places and spaces. But at the end of the day, I'm still a light because Jesus, I mean, the Bible says that the gifts of God are without repentance. That if God gave it to you, ain't nothing you can do about it. You are light. Here it is, saints of God. Why? You are a leader. Why? You are light because light is most appreciated in the midst of darkness. As we ran that scenario of what may happen on your job, they didn't speak to you when things were going well. Matter of fact, they were the ones trying to sabotage your success. They were the ones trying to do everything they could to pull the rug from underneath of you. But thanks be unto God, God was on your side. And that light that was in you could not be denied, could not be blocked out. But I thank God that we've got a light on the inside of us. And it is your light, saints of God, that illuminates the darkness and makes everybody around you want to be connected to you, want to be associated with you. They got so much adoration, they can't mind their own business. They so busy minding your business, sticking their nose in your stuff. I've come to tell you, it's because you are a light, saint of God. And light is most appreciated in the midst of the darkness. That it is when light shines that those who are in darkness make their way to the light. What do they say? Always looking for the light at the end of the tunnel. I'm looking for a light somewhere. But if I can just find the light, I can find my way. That's why you're a leader. Because you are light. And it is your light that attracts people out of darkness. It is your light that stands out from the darkness of which you have emerged and come. You are a leader. Therefore, we must accept the accountability and responsibility that are associated with being a leader. I got accepted that I got a light I can't deny. I have a light that I cannot hide. I have a light that must go shining forth that those who are in darkness must come out of the light. Now, here it is, the great problem. Is you ever been driving somewhere, and I know that we are in New York City, where we have the blessing and benefit of electricity. We got lights all around. It's really hard to appreciate this, but, but you ever been in a country or down south where it was not quite as illuminated, and at nighttime trying to find somebody's house, y'all ain't gonna help me up in here. And, 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 you know, when you've been in New York too long, I get nervous when I go down south now because it'd be too quiet, y'all. It'd be too quiet. I hear, I hear the rustling of the leaves. Y'all ain't going to help me up in here, but, but, but lest, I, lest I get off of my point, here is, a, here is a point. You ever been looking for something when you didn't have light? Sometimes it could be right there in front of you. Come on, talk to me, somebody. That, that sometimes you can be walking through a dark house and stub your toe, hit your shin. I wish I had some help up in here. But, 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 but you recognize that if I just had a little bit of light, I wish I had some help in here. If I, if I just had a little bit of light, I could make it to my destination. If, if I had a little bit of light, I could avoid some of the calamity and the tragedies that have beset me. But, but if I can just get a little bit of light, I'm here. I've come to tell you, God said you are light. And you got to let your light shine. And as we let our light shine, you can't let your light shine if you ain't present. If you ain't where you're supposed to be. Because watch this, your light is directly connected to the source. I wish I had some help up in here. And if you ain't in the right place, you can't be plugged into the source to get the fullness of what God has for you as that light that has to shine in the midst of darkness. Let's go to the next slide. Next slide. I need you here. Need you present. Now, now, now here, is, here is the reality and the challenge that comes with being a leader. As a leader, we must be in place during certain seasons. Notice the emphasis on certain, certain seasons. I think it's important. 
uh, 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 to, to, to take it off for just one second. I think it's important to, to emphasize this point. Emphasize this point. What is, what are the greatest hindrances to you accepting your role of leadership? What is the thing that keeps you from being exceptional? I would argue, saints of God, it is the requirement of consistency. That all of us can be good, can let our light shine when people are watching, when there's a lot on the line. But true leadership is discipline and consistency. Now, here it is in the midst of that. What we often fear, saints of God, is that if I fully commit and fully give, I know what's going to be required of me. I can't go up there and preach till heaven comes down on Sunday. And then next Sunday, get up there and they'd be like, Pastor must not have prayed this week. I think Pastor must have left his Bible somewhere. Amen. Y'all ain't going to help me up in here. Y'all know it's the truth. Here's somebody sing a solo one week. Next week, sound like they couldn't find a key with a flashlight. Y'all ain't going to help me up in here. Y'all know what I'm talking about. The, the, the difference is leaders that you look to, leaders that you trust are leaders that are consistent. Leaders that show up, leaders that perform. I've given this analogy many times before. The difference between a good basketball player and a great basketball player is the consistency of their performance. As we look at the NBA playoffs, what do they judge it by? Not what you do in the regular season, but how do you show up when it's game time? How do you show up when it's playoffs? How do you show up in the fourth quarter when the game is on the line? Who do you look to? You look for that consistent person, that consistent one who has put in the work. Therefore, they have no need to be concerned at the moment of performance. And now here it is, saints of God, that one of the great challenges with us accepting our roles of leadership is that we think we got to be consistent. We think we have to be perfect. We think we have to be more than we're capable of being in our present state. But can I let you in on a little secret? Quit thinking that you're more important than you really are. At the end of the day, it's God who provides the blessing. At the end of the day, it's God who provides the anointing. It's God who opens the door. So, so here it is, saints of God, that I can step up to my role of leadership when I quit placing so much on me and recognize that it's about the Lord. Now, when I recognize it's about the Lord, that, that there are some things that I have to do. And one of the things that Satan does to frustrate us from being in our place is he makes us he gets us to forget that there are only certain seasons. Go back to the slide quick, Julius, if you can. And I want us to pay particular emphasis on this. As a leader, we must be in place during certain seasons. I'm not asking you and nobody's asking you to be there 24-7, 365. Look at somebody and say, we got lives. We got bills. So I wish I had some help in here. You got kids. You ain't going to help me up in here. You got all type of responsibilities. All type of things happen in your life. Here it is that the expectation is not that you always are there, but that during certain seasons you're there. Certain seasons. I want to get to the particularity of the language. Notice what it says. Read verse 1 again at the bottom in gray, 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1. It happened in... The spring of the year at the time when kings go out to battle. Springtime, a certain time. Springtime was a certain time that kings go out to battle. You could take it off of the slide. But I want us to reflect on this, that the springtime was a specific season that was named because there was a specific assignment in that season. Specific purposes and plans that had to be carried out. Have you noticed, saints of God, that in every year there's always four seasons? Are y'all praying with me? Every year there's always four seasons. And each season has been ordained by God. Each season has been ushered in and set up to accomplish a specific purpose. Are y'all praying with me? 
And often what we miss is the interconnectedness of the seasons. I could not appreciate the harvest of fall without the heat of the summer and the rain of the spring. Are y'all praying with me? That, that I can't get to harvest in fall without doing work in the spring. Y'all praying with me that 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 even though I've done the work in the spring, I may have to go through the scorching heat of the summer to get to where I'm going to the time of harvest. Y'all praying with me that in the interconnectedness of how God works it, every season is building upon the next season. So if I miss the season where I am, I'm missing essential building blocks for what God is preparing me for in the next stages of my life. There are so many people right now who are looking for a fall time harvest but have not done the springtime work. So, so many people expecting the autumn harvest but yet they have not sowed, have not labored, have not prayed, have not believed God. I want to tell you that every season is successive and it's building on the next season. So here it is, you got to recognize a certain season that you're in. Because a certain season that you're in has a certain assignment that's setting up something for a later season of harvest. As the text says, saints of God, that, that it was springtime. And in the springtime is when kings go out to war. Now notice this. Go back to the slide just very briefly. I want to make sure I hit these points. Four seasons in every year. There is interconnectedness in the season. The springtime is a particular season with a particular purpose. You can take it off the slide. Particular season with a particular purpose. Notice that the text says that in the springtime is when kings go out to war. In the springtime is when those who have been designated with certain roles and responsibilities have assignments that's not based upon you selecting the season, but it's just the season that you've been appointed to be in. That in the springtime when kings normally would be out to war, you have a king who decided to stay home, y'all. Here is the problem, saints of God, that the springtime of our life is the active season. It is the engaging season. It is a time of military conquest and campaigns to expand and gain new territory for the Lord. And here it is, saints of God, that when God has said you got to be moving, you can't stay home. When God has said it's time to be in the battlefield, you can't be sleeping on your bed. When God has said, I need soldiers, I don't need sleepy saints. God said in the springtime, in a certain time, there's things you got to do that ain't things that you can talk about. It ain't time to plan. It's time to go out and do the work. That's what springtime symbolizes in our lives. Go back to the slide. The particularity of the certain that, listen, that, 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 that if I'm not going to go, here it is, that, 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 that as a leader... I got to recognize, and this is particularly uh, relevant on this Father's Day, that, that, that we grew up, you can take it off, I got it. You, you, we grew up when if daddy didn't go to church, I can't get no help up in here, made sure the kids got there or, or that mama got there. Now, now, now what happens, saints of God, when daddies ain't even making sure that mama get there or the kids get there? What happens, saints of God, when, when there is an expectation that no longer is happening? So we wonder why we're in the state that we're in because the Bible says train up a child in the way they should go. And when they're old, they shall not depart. But if there has been no initial training, if there has been no sowing, there's nothing for them to come back to. So here it is, saints of God, that, that David, although he was at fault, he was a king who should have been at war in springtime because he was taking an untimely sabbatical. He was taking an untimely sabbatical. He wasn't where he was supposed to be. And as a consequence, the king stayed home. And when the king stayed home, the king was missing. The assignment could not be fulfilled, but at least he got this right. That if you can't go, you at least got to care enough about the mission and the vision to send somebody in your place. 
to sin. Are y'all reading with me? Verse 1, notice what it says. Go back to the slide real quick. Uh, if we can look at verse 1 again. That David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. Notice this, that if you ain't going to go, you ought to at least send somebody. That, that if, if you're going to take an unseasonable Sabbath, an unsanctioned Sabbath, that if you're going to take some time off, you ought to at least make sure somebody is in the right place doing the right thing and carrying forth the assignment. How would you feel? How would you feel if your boss didn't show up on Friday and he was supposed to give you a paycheck? Y'all ain't going to help me up in here. He ain't call you. He ain't text you. He ain't say nothing. You done worked the whole day. And at the end of the day, you looking around and your boss ain't there. It's going to be a problem, huh? Why? Expectation. Right? Not even sending word. Not even preparing. And we wonder why God can't trust us with his best stuff because we can't be trusted with his best assignments. Because we have not made up our mind. I got to be in my place. I got to be in my post. I got to be where God has assigned me to be in this season. Because if I'm not, dangerous consequences happen. Notice what the text says. That the text says, uh, quite plainly, saints of God, that, that David was wise enough to recognize he was in an unseasonable Sabbath. And when I'm in an unseasonable Sabbath, because the re reality is sometimes you ain't going to feel like it. I wish I had some help up in here. Sometimes you're going to get tired. Sometimes other things will be going on in your life. And we will deal with unseasonable, unsanctioned, and unscheduled Sabbaths. But here it is. We ought to learn a word of wisdom from David to say, if I can't be there, the work is too important for it to stop. Y'all praying with me. Notice that the text went on to say that he sent Joab and all of Israel, and yet they were still successful in what God had called them to do. What I love about God's work and his assignment, look at somebody and tell them one monkey don't stop the show. You think you so important, just mess around and die and watch God, watch the world keep rolling on. I wish I had some help up in here. Ain't nobody more important than God's assignment and God's agenda. So if you're going to take an unseasonable Sabbath, at least find a Joab to go in your place. Can I make the connection to why it's so important, saints of God? Because the specific assignment that God has placed on your life is connected to God's word. The assignment that is placed on your life is connected to God's word. That you are a tool in the hands of God. I saw somewhere uh, yesterday that a basketball, I went out and bought a basketball the other day. It's about $35. About $35 in my hand, but a basketball in uh, LeBron James' hand is worth $25 million, $30 million a year. I can't get no help up in here. That, that I got a pen in my hand. This pen is $1.25 from the Dollar Tree. I wish I had some help up in here. $1.25 in my hand, but what is this pen in, uh, in, in, in uh, what's my man's name? What, what's this pen in, in uh, Coltrane, John Coltrane, or in, in uh, Duke Ellington, and in, in one of those who can compose and write music? I didn't want to call Beethoven because we know them, but we want to celebrate our own. But, but what is this pen in August Wilson's hand? What is this pen in Alvin Ailey's hand? What, what is it in our hand? It's nothing. It's about the tool. It ain't about the tool. It's about the hand that it's in. Now here it is, saints of God, that, that you are a tool that God is using for his word to be made manifest. His word to come to fruition. Watch this. So when I am taking an unseasonal, unscheduled, unsanctioned Sabbath, that means that I'm not available to be used by God. And when I'm not available to be used by God, that means that something is missing. Somebody ain't getting it. I'm, I'm getting ready to close here in a minute. About 10 minutes. Amen. Y'all give me 10 minutes. Amen. 
Give me, give me five or ten minutes. Here it is. Why is this point so important? God's word was on the line. Y'all hearing me? God's word was on the line. God had spoke a word to Abram. God had spoke a word to Isaac. God had spoke a word to Jacob. God had even spoken a word to David. That there was a future-oriented word for Solomon that was coming from God that was connected to what David did in this season. Remember the territorial bounds of Israel that God had declared when I bring you out of Egypt, I'm taking you to a land filled with milk and honey that shall flow from sea to river. There were some things that God said that he needed the people to carry out. Why is it so important that you find a Joab when you can't be there? Because God's word is on the line. Because the mission and the mandate is bigger than us. It's more important than us. It's about kingdom business. It's about the work of the Lord going on. And what happens when you don't show up? What happens when we're not where we're supposed to be? We give room and reason for people to criticize God. We give opportunity for the reputation of God to be sullied because of our own inadequacies. Our own failures, our own shortcomings, our own laziness, our own distractions. At least David recognized that this work is too important where if I ain't going to go, I got to send somebody in my place. Because I don't want to disrupt the momentum because there's an assignment on my life. We've got to conquer the territory. We've got to possess the land. And if I ain't going to go, I got to at least send somebody in my place that God's word continues to be fulfilled. Amen. Next slide. We're going to run through these next slides real quick. What your absence does to you. That oftentimes when we are leaders and men that are called to be in a specific place at a specific time, we don't even recognize how it's damaging us. We don't even know the devastation and destruction that's happening to us. Can I argue the text? Notice what it says. David remained at Jerusalem. He's a king. It's springtime. He's supposed to be in war, advancing the territorial boundaries of the kingdom of Israel. But he sends someone in his place, and he stays home at Jerusalem. Every time you stay home, it does damage to you. Every time you stay home, not in your assignment, where you're supposed to be, it plays on you psychologically. Physically, mentally, emotionally. Look at this. David was not physically or mentally where he was supposed to be. Your mind, body, and soul know when you're out of place. That's why your body has the emotions that it has. You ever been somewhere that you know you shouldn't be and everything in you starts telling you? You ever been talking to some people that you knew wasn't telling the truth and something on the inside of you start going on? I'm trying to tell you that's the Holy Spirit. That is the awareness of the purposes and plans that God has for you in your life. So watch this. When you're not physically and mentally where you're supposed to be, your body, your mind, and your emotions are going to tell you you're out of place. It creates anxiousness, sleeplessness, irritability, and self-medication, as an example. We're not where we're supposed to be. Not only that, but internally and subconsciously, we attempt to recreate where we're supposed to be where we are. We try to recreate where we're supposed to be. We try to recreate it where we are. Can I argue the text real quick? Look at this. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof, he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David sent and inquired about the woman. Watch this. That... The reason David was up at night and he was sleepless because he wasn't where he was supposed to be. That he couldn't sleep because it was too quiet. He was used to hearing the clanging of swords and spears, 
the, the moving and burying of, 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 of horses and, and chariots and, and used to the hustle and bustle of the centuries, those who would be moving around. So he should be doing something, but because he ain't doing something, he's anxious. He's sleepless. He should be resting at night, but he can't sleep at night, so something got him up at night. And once he's up at night, he's now vulnerable and exposed to get himself into something he shouldn't have been in that he wouldn't have been in if he was where he was supposed to be. Y'all praying with me. See, when we're not where we're supposed to be, we try to recreate it where we are. See, what happened is that David was out at night because he was used to being and knew he was supposed to be under the open skies in open fields prepared for battle to go against whoever brought it against Israel. So because he's sleepless, he's anxious, he can't go to sleep, he's wrestling, tossing, and turning, he recognizes that I ought to be under the open field, so he tries to recreate where he's supposed to be, where he is. He steps out onto the balcony at night just to behold the beauty of the nighttime sky and looks and beholds and gets in trouble. Can we go back to the slide? When you're not physically or mentally where you're supposed to be, your mind, your body, and your soul know you're out of place. Crazy anxiousness, sleeplessness. I believe he was a little irritable later on because they said, isn't that Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah? Y- y'all ain't going to talk to me. You know how when you're trying to do something that you don't, that you know you ain't supposed to do, and somebody want to remind you that you ain't supposed to do it. I know I ain't the only one who could testify. I get an attitude. I knew I was wrong. I don't need you to remind me. Y'all ain't going to help me up in here. Sleeplessness, irritability, and self-medication. He was longing for something. So what he was longing for, he tried to fulfill by connecting to an artificial stimulant. To try to connect to self-medication, self-numbing, self-help because he knew he wasn't where he was supposed to be doing what he was supposed to do. He's anxious, restless, sleepless, trying to recreate where he's supposed to be, where he is. And as a consequence, the devil's devices start actively attacking him because he's out of place. He's out of place. How does the devil attack him? This time through distraction. How does the devil attack us? Through distraction, deception, depletion, and delay. This time it was through distraction. You're more easily distracted when you're out of place because you're looking for something to fill that void. You're looking for something to settle your anxiety. You're looking for a substitute. You're looking for artificial man-made manufactured stimulants, but only the Spirit of God can satisfy. Only the mental and emotional state of knowing I'm in my assignment, in my place, doing what I'm supposed to do. Go to the last slide. We get ready to wrap up. Two more slides. We almost done. Last two slides. All right, so, so we, we talked about that, that we're leaders, that we got an assigned place to be in certain seasons. If I can't go, I at least got to send somebody. We talked about what it does to us, how it affects us. Last thing, what is the aftermath of your absence? When leaders are not in place, when men are not in place, and we're not doing what we're supposed to be, here's the question you got to ask. What message does it send about you? What message does it send to your peer group and the people that you are leading? And what future problems may be unleashed as a result of the leader's absence? All right, so, so what message does it send about you? Do you get to control the narrative your absence creates? People notice when you're not there in your appointed place at your appointed time and season. And what happens is, you can take it off the slide for this point, what we have to be ever mindful of is our good not being evil spoken of. Not putting ourselves in a situation where what we meant and attempted we're trying to do for good, somebody can manipulate it and use it for bad. Here it is, y'all. This is why communication and conversation is so important for leaders, for men, that when you ain't where you're supposed to be and you ain't told nobody, it creates an opening for people to imagine, make up, speculate, and just outright lie. I can't get no help up in here. Ain't that the truth, y'all? 
that, that when somebody ain't where they're supposed to be doing what they're supposed to do, first thing our minds start doing, there's a human proclivity to go towards negativity. There's a human proclivity to go towards negativity. That when somebody ain't where they're supposed to be, oh, they must have a problem with so-and-so. Oh, I wonder, I wonder if they gout is acting up. Y'all ain't going to help me up in here. <laughs> Amen. Here it is. This is why it's so important. Is because we're not where we're supposed to be and we don't set the record straight. Other people start talking and speculating. So in seeds of division, doubt, and discord, when it all could have been settled if we would have just communicated in the first place. So what happens is... We allow the work of the Lord to get frustrated because there's so many rumors and lies, misinformation swirling around when the people have just been in their place on time doing what they're supposed to do. And if you ain't going to be there sending a Joab so the work continues, ain't nobody got nothing to talk about because things can go moving forward. All right? Go back to the slide. Go back to the slide. So what message does it send about you? It says that you don't care. Because if you really cared, you would have been there to see it go forward. And then it says that not only do you not care, you don't care what other people say. The lies and rumors that they create, and you're wondering why you're catching the hell that you're catching. What message does it send to your peer group and the people that you are leading? That there, there are two groups, that there are your peers and other leaders. You send a message to other leaders, but you also send a message to the people that are following you. What is the message that you send to other leaders? It, it raises the question that you set the precedent. You can take it off the slide for a second. You set the precedent where if I see other people not doing what they're supposed to do, let me put it like this. You ever had an experience when the boss shows up late so everybody else starts showing up late? Y'all ain't going to help me up in here. When, when, when the pastor show up late, y'all ain't going to help me up in here. Everybody else show up late too. Right? That, that the leader sets the precedent that everybody else must adopt. But if leaders don't care, why would anybody else care? So what does it say, the sign that it sends to other leaders, but then what does it send to the people that are following you? This is the point I want to make home, that, 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 that those who have some biblical you know, knowledge of the story of David, that I believe that quite possibly when Absalom rose up against David, Absalom was the son of David who tried to revolt against David. He was able to get so many people to follow him, I believe, because they heard the story of Uriah. How one who was faithful to you, who wouldn't even go in his house, you took his wife and then had that brother murdered. Now, you got to think about what your absence and the consequences sends to other people, how you may be setting yourself up for later sabotage, later insurrection. That the way you follow your leader is the way that followers are going to follow you as a leader. What does it say? About you, what does it say to leaders and other people? Last point on this slide. Last point on this slide. What future problems may be unleashed as a result of the leader's absence? Uriah and the unnumbered and unnamed slain at his side. It wasn't just Uriah who died. A whole lot of other people died trying to kill and take out Uriah. they are unnamed and unnumbered consequences. Bathsheba left to mourn her murdered husband, knowing that his murderer, knowing that his murderer's child is growing on the inside of her. So even the relationship between David and Bathsheba, you can say what you want, it would have had lasting consequences. They might have loved each other, but she would never forget. And David ultimately loses the child and is cut to the heart in. The process. There's always collateral consequences. We don't show up. We're not where we're supposed to be. I told you, I don't want to just leave you without giving you some positive things. Let's go to the last slide. We're going to get ready to wrap up. This is our first time doing this service, so thank you for bearing with us as we work it out. 
How do we avoid the collateral consequences of absenteeism? How do we avoid the collateral consequences of absenteeism? We've got to be present and accounted for. That's it. Be present and accounted for. You've got to take personal responsibility and accountability that whatever outcomes, whatever results, I can't blame nobody else. That's my fault. There's a great book called You Are the Message by Roger Ailes. Well, he says everything that happens in your life, you got to quit blaming other people. You're the message. You're the reason. You set the precedent. You set the tone. People only do to you what, you, what they think they can get away with. People only do to you what you allow them to do to you. Now, when we see it, we got to call it out in love and follow the biblical model. we got to call it out in love in ourselves. you got to love yourself as you course correct it. you got to give yourself grace, give yourself mercy, give yourself the space to push through the initial discomfort. Because once the initial discomfort has been subsided, the blessings and benefits on the other side are unimaginable. So when I call it out in love, I got to call it out in myself first. When I am inconsistent, haven't been present, haven't been showing up the way I should. But then also, if I see it in my brother or my sister, I got to call it out in love. The Bible says that you go to your brother or your sister in love first. If they don't, you know, you can't get, get in agreement, then go take two or three elders with you, then take it to the church. So we got to practice that ethic. And we got to love the mission and the mandate and the work so much that we don't allow people to slack. Don't allow people to show up late, to not be where they're supposed to be. Because the work is too important. Too many souls are at stake. The world has literally gone crazy. God needs his Christians present and accounted for, being in our place. Because every time we're missing in action, the action is going to continue. But if you're not there, you can't control what happens. You don't know what happens. And you don't know the tragic consequences that may result. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Lord, we thank you for this word today. We pray that it has been effective, that it has spoken to us. If it's our first service, as we work it out, we ask, Lord, that you would have your way. As we go forward, help us to get our timing right, to be present and accounted for, to be in our place. Lord, we want this service to start at 8 o'clock, be over at 9 o'clock so that we can have 30 minutes to transition to Sunday school. Maybe even have some refreshments downstairs. But Lord, we see the light that's shining through us, that's shining out of us. And Lord, for those of us who can admit that we've been in darkness, we've struggled sometimes. It was somebody's light that gave us hope. The light of somebody's kind and encouraging word. The light of somebody's love. The light of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That everything is going to be all right. And Lord, we thank you. On the prayer line this morning, we were reflecting on Romans 8. And I saw a mental picture where it says the Holy Spirit makes intercession for us. And Jesus the Christ sits at the right hand of the throne of God making intercession for us. So what that means in the left ear and the right ear, anthropomorphically speaking, God has intercessors. So we are always on the mind of the Lord. So Lord, help us to always be mindful of you and the work you've called us to do in this season. We love you. We honor you. We adore you. It's the name of Jesus the Christ. We do pray and say, Lord, bless us and keep us now as we go from your gathered people to your scattered people. Rest, rule, and abide with each of us until we meet again. We promise to give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. It's in Jesus the Christ's name. We do pray and say, amen, amen, and amen again. If you've joined us today, uh, we pray that you have enjoyed this, our first morning, early glory, morning glory our power. We're going to come up with a name. Amen. Uh, we pray that you've enjoyed this first one. Asking those of you who are watching online, if you can, if you will, 
Uh, but Julius, if you could pull it up, there's four ways to give. Asking to support uh, this service is really going to have to be supported by those online. Uh, by those online, so asking if you're watching this online now or at some later point, that you will partner with this ministry, that you will be present and accounted for. There may be meat in the Lord's house, that the work and the great uh, change that is happening in Brownsville will continue to happen, and Mount Ali will play our part. This is our prayer. God bless you, and heaven smile upon you until we meet again. Go in the grace of God. Be present. Be accounted for. Be where you're supposed to be, and watch God blow your mind. God bless you, and heaven smile upon you. Amen. I want to thank each and every one.